have a fascinating story to think about this morning in the book of Job. Um, to say something a little bit about the book itself, no one really knows how old it is, how old the story is. Um, some believe it is as old as the patriarchs. It would have been a story that was around at the time possibly of Abraham. Um, there are you know, things in it that scholars look at as far as language used, and there's no history of the Israelites in it that tells of maybe an earlier time. And then also they, they say it was written probably a long time after the initial story that you know, maybe during the time of Solomon, maybe even that the story itself was written. So um, it's it's a mystery um, a little bit about this book and where it came, where it comes from. Uh, but as I said, it is um, it is an ancient story, and Swedenborg writes a little bit about this book. And does anyone? You know, it is not a book that we study in our tradition very much. Does anyone know why the book of Job is not something that we typically... Because the language is, of correspondence is doesn't fit. Right. Right. It's, it is written in correspondence, this Sweet Word says. But the... The inner meaning, the deeper meaning, it doesn't speak in a consistent way about the holy things of, of the Lord or of the church. And that's just kind of an aside, I guess. But, um, but he still says it's an excellent and useful book. And certainly I hope that we, we see that today, that there is much use, I think, in spending all time with the book of Job. This uh, story, so I just want to remind you a little bit about what happened to Job. And um, some of you um, might be familiar, very familiar with the book of Job. I'm not sure, but I just wanted to share how it begins. The first thing we learn about Job is who, just who he is. And it says of Job in here, he was blameless and upright, he feared God and shunned evil. He was a good man. He was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And what we come to find out about him is that he was a very successful man. He had a lot of servants, a lot of livestock. He had a large family. Everything was going very well for Job. And then the next thing we hear is the strangest of meetings takes place. One day, the angels came to present themselves to God, and Satan is with them. And God says to Satan, where have you been? And he says, well, I've been walking, or I've been roaming the earth back and forth. And, God, and the Lord says to him, well, what do you think of my servant Job? Isn't he wonderful? He's full of integrity, and he's a good man. And Satan says to him, basically, wow, sure, but... Who wouldn't be with his success? I mean, you take care of him. You look after him. Why wouldn't he be a good servant? And isn't there truth already in the beginning there? That it is, it can be, a life of faith can be a lot easier when things are going really well. So, God says to him, he says, well, very well. Then everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So Satan goes and does his work. He takes away his children. He takes away his livestock. And what Job is left with is his wife and his health. And it says, even in this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So then Satan comes back to God, and God says, where have you been? And he says, well, I've been roaming the earth back and forth. And he says, well, now, have you considered my servant Job? You know, all that you did against him, and look how good he is. And he says, well, sure, but any man will if he has his own life. You know, 
But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will curse you to your face, he says. So the Lord says to Satan, very well, and he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So at this, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And this is where it begins. Job is in complete despair. He thinks, what has happened? Where is God? Why is this happening to me? And he's in mourning. So what happens is he has some visitors and three friends and a fourth will show up as well who come to, uh, they're, they're his comforters. They've come to see him. And they spend a week in silence and finally Job talks and he says, curse the day I was born. Take it off the calendars, you know. I just want life to be over. I don't want to deal with this. I don't know what happened. And his friends, as their comforters, they, they start off nicely enough. They say, well, will you be patient with us for a moment? Let us speak to you. And they say things like, you know, you have helped so many yourself. But now, trouble and discouragement has come to you. You know, who, and then they say, who being innocent has ever perished? Make your appeal to God. Blessed is the man whom God corrects. And they keep saying these things to him, and all of a sudden you, get, you begin to get the sense that they feel Job has done something wrong. And it becomes clear this is the thinking. And this is in fact what Job himself felt at the beginning of the book, that God punishes when you do something wrong, and God rewards when you live a good life. So if you make a mistake, I mean you sin, God is going to do something to punish you for this. So this kind of thinking comes yeah. out. And in fact, in the beginning it says even Job would sacrifice an animal for his children just in case they might have done something wrong. So he's got the same thinking. God rewards and God punishes. But he is standing firm. And he is saying, this is not the way it works. And in fact, and this is so funny to me, because this is what our Sunday school lesson, uh, this is a portion of what it was about. And um, I just wanted to share, just for a moment, that this thinking is ancient, and yet it still exists today. And this came up in our, in our lesson today, but Jean Graber shared with me a book a couple of years ago called God, It's Your Wit's End. And one thing the author says, she had this experience. She says, several years ago, our baby Joni was born with spina bifida. And I loved and trusted our pastor, but we, as we moved through these stressful days with sorrow and fear, I wanted to ask questions in total anonymity. I didn't want my pastor even to know that my faith was completely shaken. So she decides to go to a different pastor in the town and to ask him, what is happening and why did this happen? And he says to her, Marilyn, could there be any unconfessed sin in your life? Any in your husband's life? And she's shocked by this. She said, are you suggesting Joni was born with spina bifida because of our possible sin? And so she's, this is what she calls faulty thinking in her book. But I thought, wow, you know, this, this, is, this is something important to think about and to realize this is coming up in the book of Job. And what Job is saying to his friends, they go in this conversation, his three friends, each of them speaks their turn, and Job returns the part, his part of the conversation. And for like 30 chapters, they're having this conversation, and they keep telling him, you need to confess. You know you've done something wrong. If you just confess, God will bring you back into the fold, and everything will be okay. And Job is saying, this is not how it works. I thought this was how it works. This is not how it works. I know I have done nothing wrong. 
and yet all of this is happening to me, and why? And so this is where we find ourselves at this 23rd chapter we read for today. When he says, and what he's wondering is, where is God? If I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. He cannot find God in what is happening. And he wants to stay in court. He wants to talk to God about what is happening. And I just wonder, you know, um, how does this, not just what happened to Job, we could say this is the story of everybody, good person who has experienced bad things. But more than that, or I guess as a, a different way of looking at it, I'm wondering what do you think about this experience? of him feeling like God is absent. You know, when we come to church, we invite God's presence in. We, we in Sunday school table or in church, we talk about God being with us. Our, our teachings tell us that God is so much a part of us that if he were to withdraw from us, we would instantly perish. We have no, that God is involved in every detail of our lives. But isn't it true also that it is part of this journey of faith that we also feel at times like we can't find God? I mean, not to you know nurture this feeling or this experience, but to, to lift it up and to say this is a very real part of our life, and I'm just wondering, does anybody, I know it's a very, it's a personal thing, it's, um, does anybody have anything they want to, um, to share or a comment or anything about that experience, or if that feels true to you, that it, that at times it feels like we are missing God's presence? Um, you know, for me, I, I have to say that I, I, I don't think I've ever really experienced a day where I felt like there was no God. I just have never had that sense in my life. I've never even, I've never had that feeling. But what I will say is that, and obviously I, I've never experienced the suffering that Job has experienced, but I have wished many times that I could just sit down with God. I mean, don't you wish you could put it on the calendar, you could make an appointment, and God or an angel of God could come and sit down at your kitchen table and you could have a talk? I mean, isn't that true? That we could cross that bridge somehow that we don't get to experience? No. And I'm thinking probably... Just what do you say? You know, you're going to ask. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I handle this? And, then, and that was what Logan said. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, oh, I just handled it. Mm -hmm. You know, well, think sometimes, how am I going to handle this? Right. How? You know. Right. How do I handle it? Question it, but now what? Right. What's the best way to go from here? What decision should I be making? What do I need to be working on in my life? You know? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have that kind of intimate experience in a real physical way, the way that I could have Margaret sit across the table from Margaret or something like that? I just think Job speaks to that longing. You know? That like a scarlet of the world. I won't think about it today, I'll think about it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> or that, right, or you could just put it off too, right, right. I remember one, many years ago, of course, when, when uh, the Hebner family, Kurt remembers that very well, Walt, uh, Walt uh, Kurt's dad and I drove up to uh, uh, where the accident happened, mm -hmm. and mom and dad and 
and their youngest son we, were all killed on the highway in one accident. Mm. And you have to wonder why a whole family, almost a whole family, should be gone, you know, just in a, just gone in an instant. And then you have to wonder, well, why would God allow something like this to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember that very distinctly. They were on their way here. Pardon? They were on their way here. Yeah, they were all they were on their way here oh, for church. Sunday. They were on their way over here for for mm -hmm. church that morning and uh, and the accident happened on their way here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, later on then uh, Kurt's dad, Walt and I drove up there and and you know and it was a very, very difficult kind of experience. And you have to wonder why God would let something like this happen. Mm -hmm. Almost a whole family gone. Mm -hmm. They were coming. So there are lots of unanswered questions in this life. And I guess what I, where my thoughts were um, going is, Nothing makes it easier to deal with, um, but certainly maybe it's, it, it's just a product, it's a necessary product of just being human and in this experience. You know, I was remembering reading several times um, some of our theological works about how we are created as if we are independent, you know, that we God is with us so much, we have no idea how much. But we are given a sense of being on our own so that we can make our decisions, feel that we have free will. If we didn't, it wouldn't, nothing would mean anything. You know? And God only wants us to turn to Him and to love Him when it's our choice. So we are created in this kind of independent way to experience this, but at the same time it leaves us, at times I think, feeling adrift, or wondering if we, wishing we could have a fuller sense of that presence. So what we have even from the beginning of our creation is we're created without a full picture of what's happening. You know, we cannot have a, the big picture with us like God can. And in fact, Job does get his, his day with God. And what God tells him, and he lays out this very clearly in several chapters, that Job does not have the big picture. And he says to him things like, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Do you send the lightning bolts on it their way? Do they report to you? Who endowed the heart with wisdom or gave understanding to the mind? You know, over and over again, he shared with Job, you are not seeing the whole picture. Now, in the book of Job, we might wonder, because the reader knows, before Job does, that he has made this deal with Satan. And we might wonder at that, but we can, we can get behind. We do not have the big picture. And maybe there's not, this doesn't leave us in a good place, you know, I mean, what can we do? Um, what I might just just say is that, um, well, we might not know what to do always. And this may be of some consolation. In my Bible, the commentator at the bottom after Job is meeting with God, he says this. He says, despite Job's mistakes in word and attitude while he suffered, he has now commended and the friends who had come to him are rebuked. Why? Because even in his age, even when he challenged God, he was determined to speak honestly before him. In other words, God would rather have us come with our honesty, our questions, our doubts, than to simply speak theological platitudes that are not our real, when they don't speak to our real experience. And so may we hold on 
to our honesty. May we try to love, continue loving, even in those moments when we don't feel God as closely as we would like to. And may we know, too, that even God experienced a sense of suffering and distance when he quoted, when he was on the cross, the 22nd Psalm, he said, Why have you forsaken me? And so may we know that God is also with us and understands us. I could have gone on and on about that. I'm going to end that there. But may you know that Job came through it. And in the end, he came through with a changed person and he actually has a whole new family, all new lives. Everything is added to him and uh, life goes on for Job. But he is a changed person and he knows more and understands more about life.